Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to our course on practical instruments. In this video, it's time to break out Time Profiler and get a look at the innards of our app Castigram. By the end of this video, you'll have solved the biggest bottleneck the app has, making it run a lot more smoothly. If you're running this app on a newer device, it probably doesn't really feel all that bad. If you pay attention, you should definitely see some little hiccups as the images come on screen, but if you really want to see some frames getting dropped, hop on an iPhone 5 or even better, an iPod 5G. These devices are noticeably slower and a way worse experience with this app. While it's easy to look at the list of available instruments and get a little overwhelmed, at the end of the day, you'll probably end up coming back to Time Profiler the majority of the time. While other tools may give you a little bit better perspective as to what's causing a certain problem in your app, usually you'll be able to see the same problems in Time Profiler as well. Like many of the instruments, Time Profiler uses the powerful Dtrace tool under the hood to dynamically insert itself into your app while it's running. Dtrace itself is a little bit beyond the scope of this series, but it's actually a command line tool made by Sun Microsystems to get a detailed overview of everything going on in a running program. If you think this profiling stuff is super cool, you can even make your own instruments by writing custom Dtrace scripts. Anyway, Time Profiler works by capturing your app's call stack at a constant interval. While this can technically influence the results of performance traces by introducing a little bit of overhead, you can rest assured that the vast majority of the time the results you get from Time Profiler will be more than accurate enough to clue you into the problems in your app. In the details pane, you'll see that Time Profiler builds up a call tree from the call stacks that it collects. Let's look at a sample run of an app to see how exactly it does this. Let's say we have a relatively simple app. It'll only consist of a few methods, I don't know, something like foo and bar. I don't know why, but that feels right. Here we have a sample run of your app. As time moves along, Time Profiler will grab snapshots of your current call stack at a constant interval. By default, each of these snapshots will happen one millisecond apart. In this case, about a millisecond into the run, a sample is taken, where the stack has main calling foo, which is then calling bar. So we'll just save that off into the current call tree, along with a count of how many times each method has been seen in this position in the call stack. A millisecond later, Time Profiler takes another sample. This time, the call stack was the same, so the count of each method is just increased by one. At the third millisecond, the stack is captured and we have main calling bar directly. This means we'll increase main's count like before, but this time we'll make a new branch in our call tree since sometimes main calls foo and then bar, and then other times it just calls bar. In our final call stack, we have another variation where main calls foo, which then calls a method named baz. Like last time, we'll update the counts of main and foo, and then the call to baz means we have yet another branch in our tree. One thing you may have noticed is that Baz was actually already called twice and the profiler just happened not to take samples when it was being called. This is a feature, not a bug. The thing to remember about Time Profiler is that it's not actually collecting the duration of each method your app is calling. Instead, it collects these stack traces and then counts the number of times it sees these methods in the samples. What you're seeing in the output is more of an average of how often a particular method shows up at any given time when your code is running. This means that Time Profiler can't actually tell the difference between large methods that take a long time and short methods that get called more often. This does mean that if the method is short enough and gets called infrequently enough, it may not show up at all. All right, so here we are in the Catstagram app. As we can see, it's got a pretty sweet icon, similar to some other apps, but whatever. And if we start the app up, we notice that as we scroll, it tends to be a little actually really laggy. So we're going to go ahead and fire up instruments and see if we can figure out what's going on. So to get started, you can go ahead and hit Command I to start up instruments. So here we have the template chooser and we can go ahead and just pick Time Profiler and then hit Choose. And then like you saw in the last video, you can come up here and hit Record and that'll start the trace. And then to collect some stack traces, we're just going to mess around with the app, right? Scroll it, interact with it like we normally would. And that way we can really like gather information about what's happening in our app. 
So once you've scrolled around a bit, you can go ahead and come up here and hit stop. Alright, so now that we've collected enough information to have a good call train, let's go ahead and look through here and see what information we see. The first thing to notice is the weight column over here. This is how much of the work is being done in a particular subtree. So as we can see on our main thread here, we have 46.6% of the work happening. And then we have the self-weight column. So the self-weight column is how much work is happening directly in that method, not in methods called by that method. So the self-weight column, this is going to be what you'll use to find where the work is really happening. Because there's a lot of things that happen between UI application main starting and where the actual work happens in your app. So if we click on these disclosure triangles, we can kind of drill down and see. So we have our call to main, UI application main. And as we drill down, we can find that there's a lot of system stuff going on, and it may be a little bit overwhelming at first. And it's kind of just one of those things where you have to just kind of immerse yourself in it for a while before you get comfortable in the kind of things you're going to see in here. So a lot of times you'll see this CF run loop. This is maybe one of the most common and kind of most important things to be comfortable with seeing in here. So hitting these disclosure triangles is fine, but it's actually kind of not the fastest way to do things. There's a nice trick on your Mac for any, like in Finder, anywhere that, that has these disclosure triangles. If you hold Option and click on the triangle, so when you do this Option and click, this is known as a smart disclosure. And what ends up happening is it'll drill down until there's actually relevant information. So you'll see that these calls here are where we actually start getting a lot of the big, we have like 1.2 seconds worth of work, 500 milliseconds worth of work. So these branches in the call tree are where actual like big chunks of work start happening. So this is a pretty common example of what will happen. You'll do a smart disclosure, it'll come down, and you'll have the CF run loop run. And basically the run loop is the thing that's reacting to user events and drawing things to the screen. So a lot of the code that gets run in your app is going to be run through these run loop events. Another thing to notice is these little icons over here. These are describing what kind of code is being run. So as you can see, there's like a little mug here. That means Coco, clever. We have the gear, which is system calls, like OS system calls. We have the person, which is our app itself. And the briefcase always seems to be graphic services. Anyway, now the next important thing to look at is down here we have this call tree options. So here we can separate by state. That's like whether the thread is running currently or not separate by thread, which we have by default, and is a pretty nice option because usually we want to look at the main thread. Invert call tree will flip everything around so that the leaf functions at the bottom, or I guess you could say at the top of the call stack, get flipped back up to the top of the call tree. Uh, hide system libraries will turn off all the Apple stuff and just show your code, which is pretty nice if you're looking for something that you're doing and you're drowning in CF run loop events. But it can also be a little misleading, so you kind of have to be careful not to always be hiding system libraries. Now that we've done a quick introduction, your challenge for the moment is to go ahead and like pause me and just kind of adventure through here. Click on these disclosure icons and see if you can't find any of our code that you think might be contributing to these slowdowns. Pause me for a couple minutes and then come back and we'll look into it together. All right, so hopefully you looked around a little bit. Let's go ahead and dive into this and see what exactly is going on. So like I said, a lot of times we're going to see this list of CF run loop, do observers, do source one, is servicing the main dispatch queue. When I'm doing profiling, I like to be at this spot. Because you can drill down in these guys and kind of quickly get to what your biggest bottlenecks are in your app. Now, if you were messing around a moment ago and you had chosen to do the hide system libraries, you might have gotten a call tree that looks like this, right? And like I said, it does only show your code, which can be nice. But in this case, it shows our app delegate app did finish launching method as being the biggest bottleneck in our app. Looks like allocating the cat feed view controller was the biggest thing. And in reality, this is not the most work that was done in our app. So this is an example of when this can be kind of misleading. So let's go ahead and turn that off. Now to close this tree, we can go ahead and hold option and click main thread again, and that'll close everything. And then hold option and click it again, 
and it'll open us up back to our CF run loop stuff. So let's go ahead and drill down into our top result in the CF run loop run section. And as we do, we see a lot of core animation stuff, which it's easy, when you see this kind of stuff, it's easy to think, ah, I don't really know what I would, I can't fix core animation, right? So we see transaction, transaction commit, commit, prepare commit, prepare image, copy image. So it looks like we have a lot of core animation and image stuff. As we drill down further, we have Apple JPEG. And you may not have even had to drill down this far to see this. If you go back up here and just click on the main thread, over here we have this nice heaviest stack trace, which if you scroll down, you'll see the same stuff we were just looking at. CA transaction, transaction, render, render. And then down here we have the Apple JPEG decode and all this stuff. And then finally, you if you came up here and you saw that there is these strategies, you may have clicked on this strategy and chosen to get a really good look at what's going on in the main thread. So just for an example of that, let's zoom in a little bit. And here we see our really big chunks of work, right? We have this, this one here. So if you want to zoom in on this, you can, you can click and drag to filter your call tree just to be this area. And then we can do our old trusty smart disclosure, come down here. And this gives us the same thing. Our biggest chunk of work in this big chunk of work is the Apple JPEG image decoding stuff. So this is a case where it's helpful to know a lot about what's going on under the hood. If you come over here to this big stack trace, we one thing we find is this CA layer prepare commit call. So there's a WWDC video that I'll link to in the challenge document. But if you've seen this, the presenter goes through and explains core animation, CA transactions, and then he explains the four phases of a transaction. And this prepare phase, he goes and explicitly says, this is when image views will decode their JPEGs in order to be able to display them. So if you were familiar with that, you may have noticed this prepare here and realized that, okay, well, this is just all my compressed JPEGs being uncompressed so they can be displayed. The thing about this step of the CA transaction is that it doesn't necessarily have to happen on the main thread. You can do this decompression asynchronously and that'll free up the main thread to handle scrolling and stuff like that. So that's how we'll go ahead and fix this big bottleneck. To do so, let's go back over to the Catstagram app. And if we come into the cat photo table view cell, we see we have two image views, the user avatar and the photo image view. So instead of using an image view, we're going to go ahead and make our own asynchronous image view. To do that, we can hit Command N. This will open our new file. We'll do a new Coco Touch class. It'll be a UI view. It'll be named async image view. And we'll write it in Swift. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is make this image view class able to accept an image. So we'll delete that. First, we'll make a private image variable. That way we can write a public interface with custom getters and setters. In the setter, we'll do the normal thing where we set our image to be the new value. Then we'll asynchronously decode that image and apply it to our view. First, we'll set our layer's contents to be nil. Then we'll guard against a nil image. And then we'll kick off our async job. We'll dispatch this to a global queue with a pretty high quality of service. We'll say user initiated. All right, so before we can use this method, we actually have to write it. So let's comment this out for now, then come down here. And this is where we'll actually write our method to decode images and return them. First, we'll grab our CG image from the passed in UI image. Next, we'll create a graphics context, which we'll render this into.
All right, now that we have our context and color space set up, all we have to do is render it into the context. To do that, first we call the draw method on the context. And then after that, we can just call the make image method. Now, if we successfully got an image, we return it. Otherwise, we'll return no. Oh, and up here we see we accidentally forgot to return something, so let's just return nil in this case. Ah, and here we forgot some parentheses. All right, now that we're actually creating a decoded image and returning it, we can uncomment this. And then the next step is to jump back to the main thread. After we've created our image on a background thread, we go back to main and we can assign it to our layer's contents. All right, now that we have our new class, let's go back to our cell and use it. So here we can just swap this out for an async image view. And since it accepts an image the same way an image view does, that should be all we need to do. Let's go ahead and run instruments again, take another measurement, and see if this helped with our big bottleneck. All right, so now if we stop our trace again and go back into instruments mode, we can do what we did before, do an option click on the main thread, drill down on our top result, and here we see we still have a CA transaction commit, but after we drill down, we see that it's just laying out sublayers, and if we drill down far enough, we see that our biggest bottleneck right now is just our cell for row at index path. So this is a lot better than having all that image decoding happening on the main thread. If you're wondering why doing the same amount of work, but with some of it in the background, really sped things up, it's time to take a step back. A crucial element to improving performance in iOS apps is focusing on the main thread. The main thread is the thread that's in charge of two things. First, it takes care of accepting user input. Taps can be cached by backboard D and can tolerate a main thread stalls of something like 50 to 100 milliseconds before events will be lost. Continuous gestures like swipes are much more sensitive and can only tolerate 5 to 10 milliseconds. Then, the main thread is also in charge of displaying results to the user on screen. Just as touches can be dropped when the main thread is unresponsive, the drawing of individual frames can be lost as well. The main thread draws at a constant interval where each time to draw is called the vsync. If the main thread hasn't finished its work in time, it'll skip drawing that frame. Your main goal when profiling is to get your app running at 60 frames per second. This ensures a smooth, pleasant experience for your users. In fact, Apple has repeatedly mentioned that it should be a top priority for app developers to achieve. 60 frames per second equates to something like 16.67 milliseconds for each frame to do its work. Any big chunk of work that takes more than 60 milliseconds will almost guarantee an opportunity to draw a frame as missed, aka a frame drop. That's it for our introduction to Time Profiler, and as always, we like to leave you with a challenge. This time around, you'll make another improvement to our new asynchronous image view by adding a layer of caching so it's not doing so much redundant work. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.